Hello, and thanks for stopping by. If you ever need to cross the River Thames, there are plenty of ways to do it. Along its entire length, that is from its source deep in the Cotswolds, all the way out to the Thames estuary, there are well over 200 bridges, ranging from quaint rural pontoons to the Dartford Crossing's towering QE2 bridge. Whilst along the river's central London stretch, there are of course a number of bridges, which are beautiful, world famous landmarks. Several Thames crossings thunder to the sound of rumbling commuter trains, and out towards the east, there's even a cable car if you fancy it, although this option certainly isn't one for those who have a fear of heights. Beneath the riverbed meanwhile, numerous tunnels snake through the London clay, carrying tube lines, Docklands Light Railway services and London Overground trains. If you fancy the idea of taking a walk beneath the Thames, then that's possible too, as there are three tunnels which allow the public to do this. First is the Rotherhive Tunnel, which, to be honest, isn't advisable to use if you're on foot, the reason being that the space down here is mixed use, being shared by both pedestrians and cars. This is how it looks during the evening rush hour. As you can imagine, taking a stroll through here plays havoc with your lungs, and by the time you emerge at the other end, you'll feel as though you've just puffed your way for a pack of 20. Having said that though, I do plan to cover the Rotherhive Tunnel in a separate video at some point, as it's of great historical interest. But for today, we're going to be focusing on the histories of the two other pedestrian options, which aren't choked with cars. Those being the Greenwich Foot Tunnel and the Woolwich Foot Tunnel. We'll begin with the Greenwich Tunnel, which is the oldest of the pair. Both the Greenwich and Woolwich foot tunnels owe their existence to the days when this part of London was sprawling with docks, shipyards, warehouses and all other manner of industry. To keep this massive commerce grinding on, thousands of upon thousands of workers were of course required, and although many such folk lived in the crowded East End, plenty resided south of the river too, meaning a commute across the Thames was often necessary. If you found yourself in this position in the 19th century and wished to cross beneath the river on foot, there were, at various times, several options available, although they were not very well coordinated. The world's very first underwater tunnel, the Thames Tunnel, had been forged between Wapping and Rotherhive in the early 19th century, a project that had famously been headed by Mark Brunel and his son Isambard. After years of financial difficulties and often perilous work, the Thames Tunnel finally opened to the public in March 1843, and for the first 26 years of its life, it served as a pedestrian tunnel. Some enterprising Londoners even set up market stalls down there. This function ceased however in 1869, when the subway was converted into a railway tunnel, a role it maintains to this very day, as part of the London Overground. On the flip side, the Tower Subway, close to the Tower of London, opened as a railway, a very early deep level one hauled by cable, in 1870, although after operating at a serious financial loss, it was soon converted to a foot tunnel, a claustrophobic one at that, which charged a halfpenny to use. In this guise, the Tower Subway foot tunnel remained in use until Tower Bridge made its redundance in 1898, although it still remains in place today as a utility tunnel. You can see its old entrance beside the road known as Petty Wales. Further east, in 1897, came the opening of the Blackwall Tunnel, which connects Tower Hamlets in East London to the tip of the Greenwich Peninsula. When it first opened, the Blackwall Tunnel, like the Rotherhive Tunnel today, was open to both pedestrians and vehicles. However, as you can see here, it's now strictly for cars only, having been significantly beefed up in the 1960s. Although heavily used, the Blackhall Tunnel had a main drawback, and that was it bypassed the Isle of Dogs, which, despite being a major centre of industry, remained difficult to access to and from the south due to the large horseshoe bend in the river which defines it. Building a bridge here wasn't an option, as the sheer amount of shipping which used this part of the Thames at that time would have made any such structure unfeasible 
and is indeed the reason why the Blackwell Crossing was built beneath the river. For many years then, the only way to cross directly between Greenwich and the Isle of Dogs was via a ferry. A ferry service had been in operation here since the medieval era, and by the 1620s it had come to be known as Potter's Ferry, although who exactly Potter was is now long forgotten. Samuel Pepys described the trip on this ferry in 1665, after which he became stranded for several hours on, as he called it, the unlucky Isle of Dogs. And until the 1880s, the ferry carried goods and animals as well as people, meaning you'd have likely shared deck space with pigs and cattle. In the late 19th century, a little steamer was brought into service on Potter's Ferry, although this proved costly to run and wasn't adept at dealing with harsh weather, especially fog meaning the short crossings could be notoriously unreliable, not good if you're trying to get to or from work. Today, a reminder of this now long lost service can be seen in the name Ferry Street, which is located close to where the boat would have sailed to and from. One fellow who had a firm understanding of the difficulties faced by those who had to traverse the Thames for work was Will Crooks, a man who had been born in 1852 on Sherbert Street's Poplar, just north of the Isle of Dogs. One of five children, Will had endured an incredibly tough upbringing. Born into poverty, his father, George, had lost an arm in an accident when Will was just three years old, meaning his mother, Caroline, who worked as a seamstress, was left as the main breadwinner. Sadly, the financial pressure eventually became too much to bear, and in 1861, when Will was aged just nine, all of the Crooks children ended up being sent to the Poplar Workhouse. Once he was old enough, Will became a dock worker, grafting in both London and Liverpool, which, judging by photos of him in his prime, helped him mature into a pretty tough looking bloke. And being a gifted speaker, driven by the poverty he'd experienced, Will entered politics. This led him to be elected to the London County Council in 1889, where he was soon made chairman of the Bridges Committee. After being closely involved with the creation of the Blackpool Tunnel, apparently no other politician spent more time at the work site, Will, knowing the challenges faced by workers who needed a quick way of crossing the Thames, began pushing for a tunnel between Greenwich and the Isle of Dogs. At first, it was hoped this new tunnel would be similar to the one at Blackpool, in that it would be large enough to carry both vehicles and pedestrians. However, the sheer amount of industry clustered around the southern end of the Isle of Dogs meant this wasn't feasible, as there was no room to construct the long, sloping road required for such an underpass. And so, a simpler foot tunnel, referred to at the time as the Working Men's Tunnel, which could be accessed via a lift and staircase, became the favoured option. The task of designing the Greenwich Foot Tunnel was handed to the civil engineer Sir Alexander Binney, who would already worked on the Blackpool Tunnel and would later go on to design Vauxhall Bridge, whilst the contract for constructing the project was awarded to John Cochrane & Co. After gaining permission from an Act of Parliament in 1897, Construction on the foot tunnel commenced in 1899, with a shaft being sunk at the Isle of Dogs in Island Gardens, a park which, by the way, had been officially opened by Will Crooks. The tunnel was dug by hand, with the men protected by a tunnelling shield and compressed air, similar to the method used in the curation of London's earliest deep level tube lines. Progress was swift. The digging advanced at an average of 10 feet per day, and having been completed for the sum of £180,000, about £18.5 million in today's money, the Greenwich Foot Tunnel was officially opened to the public on the 4th of August 1902. Open 24 hours a day, the tunnel is accessed via a pair of glass domed rotundas. On the Greenwich side, this entrance is beside the Cutty Sark, and on the northern side, you'll find it in Island Gardens a short distance from the Docklands Lights Railway Station of the same name. The Greenwich side is slightly higher, having 100 steps, as opposed to 88 on the Isle of Dogs, whilst the tunnel itself stretches for 1,215 feet, or 370.2 metres, 
and is about 9 feet or 2.74 meters wide. As well as the stairs, you can also enter and exit the tunnel via a large wood panelled lift, which, although now automated, were for many years worked by attendants. The tunnel's walls are lined with cast iron rings, although these can't be seen since they've been topped with concrete and ceramic white tiles, of which there are around 200,000. As you can see here though, this particular section, located close to the Olive Dog's End, looks rather different. And that's because, close to here, during an air raid, early on the evening of the 7th of September 1940, a bomb exploded, smashing the tunnel wall. In the wake of the blast, water gushed in, and it took 10 days to pump the tunnel dry. These thick iron collars were bolted in to patch up the damage. It was important to keep the tunnel open, as due to the role it played in keeping workers and industry connected, it was vital to the war efforts, and the hasty repair work has remained in place ever since. It's also possible to see scars caused by shrapnel damage from the Blitz on the wall of the Greenwich Rotunda. Over the years, the Greenwich Foot Tunnel has appeared on film and TV on numerous occasions, most famously in 2007's 28 Weeks Later, when it's used by the main protagonists in a desperate dash to escape a terrifying inferno at Canary Wharf. You can see the Greenwich Tunnel in the artwork for the Who's 1973 album, Quadrophenia, and it also appears in the Iron Maiden music video, Two Minutes to Midnight, and the 1980s comedy drama, Prospects. In two other television dramas, the Greenwich Foot Tunnel has been used to depict disturbing dream sequences. In 1997's Original Sin, the character, Francis Peverell, ventures into it as a child and discovers blood oozing from the tunnel wall. Whilst in 1980's epic family drama, Fox, the boxer Kenny, played by Ray Winston, has a nightmare set in the tunnel as he struggles to cope with the aftermath of a title fight that went tragically wrong. Naturally, due to its eerie, echoing nature, especially at night, the Greenwich Foot Tunnel is said to be haunted. Apparently, there are three spirits who lurk down here. The first is said to be that of a young girl, aged around eight, whilst the other two are a turn-of-the-century couple who, according to those who claim to have seen them, walk arm-in-arm -arm towards you before vanishing. Being so close to the tourist hotspots that's Greenwich, the Greenwich Foot Tunnel is far better known than its younger cousin, the Woolwich Foot Tunnel, which lies further east. This, coupled with the fact that its entrances are far more isolated, means the Woolwich Tunnel is used far less, and as such, tends to feel a lot more deserted, arguably making it one of the creepiest places in London. Although it looks pretty much the same below ground, the two entrance rotundas are less grand than their Greenwich counterparts, as they lack the fancy glass domes. On the north side, you'll find the rotunda on Pier Road, whilst on the south side, the entrance is tucked away on Glass Yard, in an unassuming spot behind the waterfront leisure centre. Stretching for 1,654 feet, or 504 metres, the Woolwich Foot Tunnel is a bit longer than the one at Greenwich, and it links North Woolwich to South Woolwich, Woolwich being an area that's unusual in that it straddles both sides of the Thames. Although the Greenwich Foot Tunnel completely replaced the old Potter's Ferry, the Woolwich Ferry, which having began operating in the 1880s, is far more of a household name than the tunnel, remains in service to this day, and is perhaps one reason why fewer people go for the subterranean option. If you want to use the Woolwich Foot Tunnel, you'll also need a strong pair of legs, as at the time of making this video, the lifts at both ends are currently out of order. They've been in this broken down state for a considerable amount of time now, and it doesn't look like they're getting fixed anytime soon. Apparently, it's difficult to get hold of the spare parts, which have to be ordered from Germany. Like the Greenwich Tunnel, the Woolwich Tunnel was intended primarily for workers. Woolwich in those days, for example, was home to the mighty Royal Arsenal, 
which employed 80,000 people at its height. And again, it was a project that owed a lot to Will Crooks, who would later go on to serve as the Labour MP for Woolwich. When the Woolwich foot tunnel was first being planned in 1904, a rival scheme, promoted by the North and South Woolwich Railway Company, was also being touted, their desire being to forge a tunnel at the same point, through which electric trains would run. However, this scheme was opposed by the London County Council, who, fair play to them, argued that any such crossing linking North and South Woolwich should be one that was free for the public to use, and as such, the railway plan was quickly pushed aside. The Woolwich Foot Tunnel was designed by the Irish engineer Sir Maurice Fitzmaurice, whose first job had been on Scotland's mighty 4th Railway Bridge, and the construction contract was given to Waiter Scott and Middleton Limited, who, as with the Greenwich Tunnel, got the job done with the aid of compressed air and a tunnelling shield. And despite being tasked with making a longer tunnel, they managed to do it for a cheaper price than the Greenwich Subway. The Woolwich Foot Tunnel opened to the public on the 26th of October 1912, and apart from being the site of many a drunken brawl, which were alarmingly common in the early 20th century, the newspaper archives are full of such reports, it's led a pretty quiet life in the years since. As far as I'm aware, no ghosts have been reported down here, although maybe so few people use the tunnel, perhaps we're just not seeing them. In recent years however, an urban legend has emerged, which claims a strange time anomaly exists within the tunnel. It said that this phenomena was discovered by workers carrying out renovation work on the tunnel in 2011. Apparently some found that, after spending several hours grafting below the river, they'd emerge to discover that in real time, they'd only be gone for a few minutes. The idea that a bizarre time abnormality exists in the Woolwich Tunnel is of course a hoax. Well, I'm assuming it is. But I'll leave a link to the article which started it all in the description, as it makes for a fun read. There is one real mystery associated with the Woolwich Foot Tunnel though. On the evening of Saturday the 6th of March 1926, an unidentified man was found collapsed down here. This unfortunate fellow was rushed to Plumstead Hospital, but upon arrival he was found to be dead, the cause of which was undetermined. A report stated at the time that the deceased was, quote, 40 years of age, 5 foot 7 inches in height, pale complexion, and wearing a light fawn overcoat, dark grey coat and vest, blue trousers, blue and white Oxford shirt, blue and white scarf, grey cap, brown leather belt, black socks and lace boots. The stranger however had no form of identification upon him, and despite the detailed description, it would appear who he was, and why it collapsed in the tunnel, remains unexplained to this day. Years later, in 1986, the Woolwich Foot Tunnel appeared in a climax to the BBC children's drama, Running Scared. Despite being aimed at youngsters, the series was surprisingly gritty, as it presented a realistic portrayal of organised crime in London. In the final episode, the main character, Paula Prescott, who is in possession of a damning piece of evidence, is chased through the tunnel by East End gangster Charlie Elkin, played by Chris Ellison, who most viewers will probably remember as DCI Frank Burnside from The Bill. All of this makes the Woolwich Foot Tunnel sound rather grim, doesn't it? To end on a lighter note then, here's something that will no doubt make you smile. In July 1938, new regulations regarding the tunnel were passed, one of which stated, No person shall drive or conduct into the tunnel any cattle or any animal forming part of a menagerie. So, if you are hoping to bring a cow down here, then I guess you'd better think again. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this look at London's Thames foot tunnels and would love to hear your own thoughts on them. Out of the Greenwich and Woolwich tunnels, which one do you prefer? Have you ever been spooked in either of them? And if you could build another foot tunnel beneath the Thames at any point, where would you decide to place it? Please be sure to let me know in the comments. Thank you so much to all of you who support my channel with your kind words, likes and shares. I couldn't do this without you. If you haven't yet subscribed to Rob's London, then I'd appreciate it very much if you could please consider doing so.
as this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive notifications, will ensure that you don't miss out whenever I publish a new video. Plus, of course, it would be wonderful to have you along. If you're feeling extra generous, you can also support my work with a tip via either my Ko-fi account, which I'll link below, or the YouTube thanks button, which appears as a heart icon beneath the video. Any such financial donations are, of course, greatly appreciated, and they really do help go towards creating content. Anyway, on that note, thanks again for watching, friends. Stay well, and please be sure to stay tuned.